failed attempt uh, to introduce JIS um, in 2014. Uh, it included a very uh, remark uh, prominent lawyer, uh, soon to become non deputy again, uh, Chopon Jakubova. Uh, it included pretty much every, everyone else as well. And uh, so the Constitution was already uh, so much criticized that the people were mentally, psychologically prepared already uh, for introduction of changes before 2020. So uh, despite all of these uh, uh, valiant attempts uh, by a number of uh, prominent politicians and civic activists in, in the fall, late summer and uh, most of the fall of this year, it was uh, ultimately quite difficult to stop the train, uh, the motion that the government had launched. Secondly, I think another thing that made it so easy to go for this referendum is that we had we, we continue to have very weak political parties, very fluid party lines, and therefore a very easy way for the government, President Atambayev, to construct a, an impressive majority of the parliament who support this, uh, the need to change the, refer uh, to change the constitution and to call for a referendum. Uh, as you might remember, about 90 people had signed, or more, even more than that, had signed uh, an initial call for, uh, uh, for a referendum, which obviously had been questioned for all sorts of legal breaches and uh, ability based on the existing law. But uh, the fact that such a great majority of the, uh, of the sitting parliaments uh, had supported it made it a little uh, disheartening. For the opposition, for the uh, for those who did not think the referendum was a uh, legal to vote for. Now that fluidity of party lines could be seen very easily as toward the late part uh, on towards the referendum when, for example, he, uh, the leader of the Kyrgyzstan political fraction in the parliament started to backstep. At some po at one point he was the main speaker for the referendum. Soon and he turned around. He said. Uh, we should not be uh, as deadly, we should not be forced, and our hands should not be twisted to support the referendum and things like that. Same thing, uh, turnaround happened with Urdu pro political parties, who withdrew their support uh, toward the end. So you can see that uh, the political party, the weakness of the uh, institutions of political parties, was one main condition for all this rather dubious sort of referendum. And lastly, I think uh, very importantly, even though Kyrgyzstan has seen now uh, the fourth president, we have not yet really seen a, a, a comforting, good example of an ex-presidency. Uh, two presidents are not very comfortable in their conditions nowadays, and one president was elected in an ordinary way, and her legitimacy was, kept, uh, was undermined by the current president himself uh, just two months ago. So, for President Atabayev to imagine his post-presidential life, obviously uh, it must be a very idea to completely leave the scene and leave it for whatever uh, fate has to be. So, uh, all of these conditions, I think, uh, of course there were many others, I, I suppose, but these were, I think, some of the important reasons why it was a well, relatively easy and um, acceptable thing for this constitutional change to take place. Now, in the end, what do we gain uh, by these changes? I, uh, of course, we could go on for quite a bit uh, in terms of the very specific details of about 30 different changes in the constitution. And it is, of course, not a surprising thing that people were asked to yes or no in a single uh, uh, mark for all of these very different sorts of changes. It would have been much more reasonable uh, to ask people with, with that sort of a single answer if the question were, would you like us to go back and redraft the constitution? And then that would open the way for a, a new constitutional council to do the work. But obviously that's not the tradition in Central So what we do have now, I think, is uh, uh, one thing is the, the emerging sense of uh, constancy or consistency of the Constitution has been broken. Over six years of not changing the Constitution was the longest that the President, uh, that Kyrgyzstan has had so far. And this has uh, come to a sad, uh, rather unfortunate end. So Kyrgyzstan yet again, uh, I think the population in Kyrgyzstan has basically lost any that any Constitution can last 
uh, beyond a single presidential term. Secondly, I think, more practically in politics, it opens a number of possibilities. One is the most obvious and rational thing for the incumbent uh, political party to do is, of course, to uh, look for ways to ascertain its uh, comfort or even dominance in the coming years. And I think uh, this constitution does open some of the ways, but without serious guarantees. So it would be a guaranteed, comfortable time for President Azerbaijan and his uh, Social Democratic Party come 2017, uh, end of 2017, if the parliament continues to be dominated by the Social Democratic Party in the ruling coalition, and if President Azarbayev and his host allies somehow manage to get a likable, loyal, cooperative president to be elected, and if, barring that, uh, this uh, the loyal presidency taking place, then uh, making sure that a very strong and, again, loyal prime minister can last longer than just one year will also be installed in the parliament. Now, all of these are big ifs. And one thing that's been now discussed in Kyrgyzstan since the referendum already took place is whether Azerbaijan might still go for something that President Bakiyev did in his time, which is call for a snap three-term parliamentary elections again. Because the par uh, constitution has changed so much, and the parliament's powers, authorities have changed, have been revolved so much, the parliament's interaction with prime minister and the president, the president have, have all changed very much. It does make sense for a new parliament to be called, to be elected, because this parliament did not get elected based on current, the new version of the constitution now. Now, obviously, there is a big risk with that as well for the Social Democratic Party, which is you call a snap election, you don't win a majority. And plus, of course, there are all sorts of popular unacceptance of such a that I might require to do there at all. So, for all of these uh, said, I think what will what President Abbas will try to do, given the new powers, according to the Constitution now, is during this year to pack all of the current positions, small and large, with very loyal, social democratically aligned uh, people, especially its judiciary, but also whatever is left in the executive that's not touched yet. And then, and then try very hard and work with the most electable, most likely uh, presidential candidate uh, to be also uh, somebody who is very loyal and uh, cooperative. These are very big uh, ifs and with uh, very big uncertainties that uh, the president should not be feeling too comfortable about any of this. Thank All right, thanks. I want to check to see if there are any questions at this point in the room. Some comments. Uh, not question, really. May I? Yes, uh, but uh, just pull that microphone a little bit closer, just just in case. Oh, oh, there's one there. Okay, you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead. Okay. Right after and even before the referendum, I had a lot of discussions and conversations with the Kyrgyz service, not only in my capacity as the regional director for Central Asia, but also out of my own interest and out of my own favoritism for Kyrgyzstan as a country and nation. I think listening to all the critical points, what I have been hearing about the referendum and the Kyrgyz president and the Kyrgyz government and the Kyrgyz system and experience since 2005, at least my recollection and my assumption from the all from all these discussions is that yes the kyrgyz people want to change to a different and better more comfortable more democratic like of government yes there are problems like what we said about how to consolidate the power of the ruling party or the president and so on. But no, this is not like what happened in Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan. That means if the constitution requires the Senate head to become the acting president and then go to elections, you just appoint yourself or change the constitution short before you, you want to... Huh? Or easily neglected. Or neglected and pass a law and or referendum or whatever, and, and you decide that whoever wants to become the next president, a dentist in Turkmenistan, for example, yes, the, the next president should be a dentist, for example. That is passed. Referendum is passed, constitution is changed, and the person in question, Mr. 
president of Turkmenistan, the new whatever he is Arkadar. being called, Arkadar, is the president. In Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan, for example, usually the Senate leader would become the acting president. No, they changed it, and no, they didn't. They, they didn't. Don't change it. They just don't bother with it. They yes, just, no. you know, they didn't yes. care about it. That is my point. I, I, question one question or a few questions I have for Venera and other colleagues who about this year to okay, what is exactly the points change in this set of changes that we object to? I frankly didn't hear much substance in I, these critical critical remarks, although I know it has changed in the process. Yes, there were mainly two questions raised. One was this supremacy of NGOs and foreign organizations, and second one was the, the, the marriage issue, that marriage could be done between men and women. And my point here, in defense of the, of the Kyrgyz government, not government, but the, the way of, of political life in Kyrgyzstan, is that this is nothing very unusual. We have America, the United States, does not uh, comply with, with the Hague court decisions on human rights. They don't. This is the supremacy of the local federal uh, jurisdiction of the United States of America and many other countries. Or marriage between, between men and men or women and women or whatever is not approved in all states of, of the U.S. or not even in the European Union is not approved even now. So we are comparing, criticizing this, and rightly we are taking issue with these things. We are comparing Kyrgyzstan with EU and US, not with Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. I, to keep I, I think that, that's an important piece of context that we should have, and just before Venera starts, we should note that Kyrgyzstan, compared to the rest of Central Asia, uh, is a much more open society where in, yeah. where we can op- Russia, even with Russia. yes mm-hmm. where, where where we can operate more uh, more freely than in many other places and you know we're we're, we're not talking about another Turkmenistan here it's, it's yeah. a different context yeah, it, but, but but go ahead Vanessa. yeah different country we our expectations are much higher than in EU maybe because those people <laughs> came, those people took power after revolution. The revolution. They promised to build a real democracy. And so I agree with Emil that there was understanding in the society that constitution written in 2010 had many mistakes or some failures. Something, uh, many things had to be fixed. But since in 2010 they agreed among all politicians that the constitution cannot be changed till 2020. Why there was a rush? Yeah. And, I have a question. In a, a manner, in a manner that uh, even in the parliament they asked, who is the author of this um, amendment? And presidential administration representative was naming different. Uh, we also call White House the government house in Bishkek because it's made out of white marble. And so it, it, he was naming different employees of the White House like unknown people. The, it is clear that President Atambayev decided that that agreement from 2010 was some naive gentleman's agreement and he didn't want to follow that deal. But all this creates, as I said, a bad tradition, bad inconsistency in politics. And that there is a need for changing the constitution. Why not to make in a way, as Emil offered, like he said, as it happened in 2010, establish constitutional council of professionals, lawyers, academics, and make them fix the constitution, but make public discussions and everything. So to make it, I, I mean, the best constitution for Kyrgyzstan, and so it, it shouldn't be changed again. When next president comes, there is no guarantee. He or she will want to change constitution again. Uh, the new, oh, sure. Yeah, the, the question I have for, for Emil, uh, you know, if there is an agreement not to change on, until 2020, I guess this is a clause in the constitution itself. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So a brief meaning mention. that yeah. the, they kind of breached constitution to to make an, an amendment into the same constitution. But what are these? defense mechanisms for the future? I mean, did, did they set again another date for not changing, like for, or what? It was like a defense mechanism, one of those that did not work, obviously, in this case. No, uh, it's a very good question, actually. Uh, so, uh, 
Now, uh, after this referendum, there is no defense mechanism because uh, Article 114, which has been the main uh, point of discussion between the opponents and proponents of the referendum, was that I, the way I read it, and the most and most uh, serious lawyers have read it, is that uh, Article 114 clearly says that until 2020, there is no way because this constitution has, can be changed. Now, certain article, certain article, certain chapters of this yeah, constitution. Well, uh, except except for the closing chapter, which is about this constitution, and the first chapter, which is about the fundamentals of the country. Uh, but uh, everything and but those who said it was possible to leave uh, to change it, argued that it was only uh, banned for the parliament to change it. Changes, but the people can. But there's yet another way that, that the parliament that the parliament cannot even initiate a referendum, call for a referendum. But only the people could call for a referendum. But obviously there was no popular call for a referendum at this point. So anyway, I, every word and every uh, comma and period in that article was up, turned upside down uh, by so many different people. But uh, the way was open. Uh, I think. It was clear to anyone uh, genuine enough to read that the spirit of that article in the Constitution was uh, clear. That until 2020, we commit not to change the Constitution the way we have changed it until then. Now, given the fact that we have found the loopholes enough to make the Constitution change possible this time, now I think, as I said earlier, I mean, uh, if for six years we thought we probably will learn how to cheat, how to live by one constitution for long enough, now I think that also, that faith has been lost, and no other article or anything will be helpful anymore. But uh, to the previous question about only two uh, changes were mentioned and why is everyone so adamant about these changes? I think well, one principal thing is that the very fact that constitutional change took place is one of the things that the critics are so uh, disagreeing with. Now, there are many other things disagreeable in the actual changes to the Constitution, including, for example, the possibility that a person could be uh, deprived of her citizenship. That's now left to a constitutional law outside of the Constitution, whereas previously it was an absolute categorical no, you cannot be deprived of your citizenship. Another is whole, uh, one almost third of the Constitution you now changes uh, touch on the judiciary system, which in the end make uh, make the judiciary very dependent and open to uh, influence by the president's office and the parliament. So uh, these are some of the issues that I think are very seriously untoward uh, toward democracy. Other questions in the room? Yes, uh, come up to, to the microphone so we can hear you on the podcast. Oh, yes. I think two months ago, uh, Atam Baif told that Putin and Nazarbayev asked him to stay for one more uh, presidential term. And he answered that uh, he can't do that because our people are different and they will not tolerate. So the question is that, is there any foreign influence on what is going on in, in Kyrgyzstan nowadays? Bruce, you have any thoughts on that? You know, if there is, I, I personally don't see it. I look at this as more uh, Atom Bayev's personal initiative. I mean, he seems to be the driving force behind these changes. I, I didn't ever get the impression that there was someone outside the country that was pushing him or anybody else in Kyrgyzstan to, to make these changes. It seemed to be something that the president's office had, had cooked up and decided they were going to push yeah, forward. It should come from somewhere or from... The general atmosphere. Of As I explained, the President Atambayev uh, just uh, the situations with Atim Janaskarov, with Kumtor, and with other uh, constitutional chamber made a decision that government employees cannot be su uh, charged by National Security Committee, and that m outraged him, made him very angry. Such situational affairs pushed him to make changes. And of course, he heard many voices that there should be a rebalance of power. I mean, the, the prime minister became a very shy, very invisible person in Kyrgyzstan right now. Within this atom by term, we have fifth prime minister right now. And they were all like very shy, very uh, in shadow figures. And then he decided, okay, we will give a little bit more power to prime minister. That if, but if you are going, if, you, if, if he was sincere last November, and when he said, we have to build a real parliamentary democracy in Kyrgyzstan, then he had to go much further 
in rebalancing the power. But they did just a few very, very modest steps. And I think if Nazarbayev and Putin would advise him how to change the constitution, then we would see a completely different <laughs> constitution now. Well, let, let's just extend this uh, discussion of, uh, of Kyrgyzstan and other countries. Um, so, uh, on, on one level, Kyrgyzstan seems very interested in in being really independent. They they closed down the U.S. military use of the airfield there. Uh, now Atambayev says that the, the Russians are going to have to stop uh, having military uh, installation there. Um, how independent is Kyrgyzstan's foreign policy? Uh, okay. Uh, not Certainly not as much as they wish. Um, they were basically forced into the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, they had um, almost no choice at all. They were being strangled uh, by, by the rules of their neighbors. Of course, we knew that, that Kyrgyzstan is, is like a re-export economy for the most part. They buy stuff in China, they re-export it. But when Kazakhstan, their neighbor to the north, was, since Kazakhstan was part of the Eurasian Economic Union, it, it, all of a sudden it cut off trade there. So, that, so Russia en- ended up getting more influence because they, they basically compelled Kyrgyzstan to join the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, and uh, so far the results have not been good. Um, trade has, has continued to fall, um, but but even the military base there, you know, that was an agreement that dates back to Akayev. And when when Putin and Akayev agreed that there was going to put this military base on there, there was already the U.S. military base at Manas at the time, and they decided that they would. The Russians wanted the Kant base, but you know the the way the Russians phrase that is it's not a base to protect Kyrgyzstan so much as it's like a regional base. It's part of a, a chain that includes uh, the bases in Tajikistan, for instance, too. But yeah, I mean, it certainly undercuts the the sovereignty of Kyrgyzstan because they're not free to make a lot of decisions they wish. Uh, You know, like I said, economically, Russia's pressured them into joining the Eurasian Economic Union, so now they have to live by the regulations of that uh, organization. Atambaya, for all all his tough talk about we should close the Russian military base, uh, you know, that that's after his term has expired. And this is, you know, he was saying soon, I think by the middle of the next decade, but the chances that's going to happen are almost none. And it's it's open to renegotiation uh, by, by a future administration. So I don't really see that. Within the country, for most of the domestic politics, Kyrgyzstan is free to, to dictate its own terms and make its own laws. But, but when it push comes to shove, I think Russia's demonstrated again and again that they consider that part of their backyard. And Kyrgyzstan really didn't have very many options for allies, unfortunately. You know, they're they're wary of the Chinese. They like the Chinese money, but they don't want too much Chinese influence. Russia is at least a country that they know. A lot of people still speak Russian. uh, And, of course, Russian TV is available. So by itself, Kyrgyzstan would have a hard time standing up. They don't have the necessary resources to really make a go of it economically. Uh, they need they need an ally, someone who's going to help them out. And in this case, really the only and country that fits that, exist. huh? And that ally does not exist. Well, the only country that even fits that profile is Russia at the moment. They're the only ones that are really going to help them out in terms of what, security. What about, what about China? Well, China can help with some money, but like I said, especially since Kyrgyzstan actually borders China, they're they're really like I said apprehensive about getting too close to the Chinese, the money, the investment, and, and certainly it's helped the country out in terms That's of infrastructure. The with other Central Asian. Yeah, but some of them have a little more distance. <laughs> Emil, uh, maybe can so. add something with his field. Excuse me, we have another. Um, I, I think Bruce is saying uh, pretty much, uh, uh, I agree with everything you're saying. I think uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, has as much liberty as it doesn't uh, cause any problems or any irritation to major players outside. And as soon as we step on some more serious issues that others have staked on, I think Kyrgyzstan will, will have to take a step back. And President Atambayev, of course, has his very um, uh, special style in speaking, including on foreign policy matters, which does give this air of uh, some greater autonomy and independence. But in the end, when, when it comes to more serious counting the chicken, as it were, I think uh, Kyrgyzstan has very limited choices. and. Uh, it's a good thing that so far uh, the country has been more or less able to juggle between uh, different close allies and to remain to maintain some degree of ability to do things without uh, consulting Moscow. Now, obviously, we have even narrowed down that sometimes by, for example, uh, angering Ankara, think on this and that. Uh, sometimes not being too nice in our this uh, verbiage for Tashkent or Astana. So, yeah, Kyrgyzstan, the leadership is free 
very often behaves very freely, but that usually does come back in a boomerang to the country. So China is the biggest economic investor, and Turkey is a very big investor in the education system. And of course, Russia owns the gas company. So. <laughs> And on that note, we will end. Uh, our allotted time is coming to an end. Uh, Venera and Bruce, thank you so much. And Emil, it was very, very kind of you to join us in Bishkek. I'm thank sorry you had to fight the thank traffic you. on the thank way you. in.